Hello, uh, welcome to this morning's webinar on multi-occupancy buildings insurance. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, thanks particularly to anyone taking time out of half term, if they're on that. Um, no doubt you will appreciate the rest from childcare. Um, but to everybody else, uh, thank you for joining uh, from the office and uh, hopefully it will be a really interesting session and we will learn uh, something about the latest FCA reforms. So uh, on the 29th of September, the FCA published a policy statement setting out new rules for multi-occupancy buildings insurance uh, as part of the, the very long tail following the tragedy at Grenfell. Um, we believe at the BPF that this will have wider ramifications than just residential uh, development. Um, and hopefully by the end of this webinar, um, it will be clearer as to why we think that and why um, people should be thinking about it in the property industry beyond just the residential sector. This morning, we have a very distinguished panel uh, of experts from Deloitte and WTW Law Firm, and we will be running the webinar um, along this, uh, this agenda. Um, from Deloitte, we have Laura Scarpa, Carolina Viali, uh, Charlie Morris, and Rob Phillips. And from WTW, we have Paul Turnbull, but I will let them introduce themselves in more detail uh, as we get to that section of the webinar. Um, as you may have noticed, we are recording this and the recording will be on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming days and in the next couple of days. And we'll also be sharing it on our social media channels. So please do look out and you are very free to share that with any colleagues um, or acquaintances that weren't able to attend. Um, this webinar is one of the many things that we do at the BPF. Um, we couldn't do it without the invaluable contributions of the panel, but it's uh, one of several that we put on uh, throughout the year. Um, it's the second one that I've done this month alone. Um, and just uh, for those who aren't aware, uh, and I'm sure many do know as uh, you are members, but we are the voice of UK real estate. We represent a wide range of institutional and large investors. Um, and uh, we are, I suppose, the voice of the industry, it, particularly insofar as uh, relations with government and other key stakeholders are concerned. Um, for members, these are the three key benefits that you get to help shape the, the real estate world uh, and policy environment particularly. And we create opportunities for you to raise your profile. And there are um, great opportunities to get access to market insight and knowledge such as this webinar. Um, it's also worth noting that um, you can access a huge amount of information through the My BPF portal via our website that's uh, accessible on the top right corner of our website. Um, for anybody who doesn't access it, I do recommend that you have a look. Um, there's lots of information there, lots more information about events, so please do check it out. Um, I should also say that we run something called BPF Futures, which you can see is one of the tabs up there on our website. Um, this is a network available to anybody in the real estate industry uh, who has been involved in it for less than 10 years. So it's an experience level or time of, of employment level rather than um, an age limit. Um, but it is a younger network, as you might imagine. Um, really worth connecting any younger or less experienced colleagues uh, in your business to this network. It's a really great network. I think of over 2000 people, they run a whole series of events, there are mentoring um, and menteeing opportunities. So please do have a look at that. Right, without any further ado, I will hand over to uh, Laura from Deloitte who will introduce herself and get into the meat of this webinar. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dominic, for that welcome and also for giving us the opportunity to um, present at the webinar today and share our thoughts and perspectives on uh, the direction of travel in the multi-occupancy buildings insurance market. So we're delighted to join you today to walk through the changes that the FCA um, is has proposed and is, is going to implement. Um, we're we um, are quite well acquainted with, with this market, having been uh, involved in it for some time. Um, so Carolina and Rob are two of my team members that work with me on a project for the FCA in uh, 2022, where we help them engage with the market, both on the demand side and the supply side. So talking to freeholders, property managing agents, insurers and brokers and getting their views on uh, how this how well this market was functioning. And we're also joined um, in the session today by my colleague Charlie, who's one of our conduct specialists. 
and he's been working on a number of projects in this space, touching on the key areas that the FCA is really digging into here. So things like product governance and fair value and remuneration in the distribution chain. So together, the team is going to help you um, walk through uh, what the changes um, look like, uh, what the impact will be on the sector, and, and the sort of steps you should be thinking about and considering, bearing in mind there's um, a December 2023 deadline, so um, two months to go. And I should probably introduce myself as well. So I'm a partner in Deloitte's regulatory assurance practice, and I primarily focus on the insurance sector. So I help firms in the sector navigate regulatory change by helping them understand the proposed changes, the impact on their business, and also the potential steps they can take to help address or tackle the sort of issues. Um, so thanks for having us. And we'll we'll spend the next 20 minutes or so walking you through those points. So Dominic, if you move on to um, the next slide. Um, this is the sort of timeline of, of events uh, that, that we've seen in terms of how the FCA has been position, positioning this change and giving the market signposts as we go. And the September 22 report uh, pointed to the work that the team and I worked with the FCA on to sort of help them engage the market. And that was really the starting point for, for a lot of the, um, the work that has, has been released more recently. If we move on to the next slide, I wanted to take it back a step uh, and just start really where it all began. So where did it all begin? In January 2022, the FCA received a letter from Michael Gove, who at the time was the Secretary of State for the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, DLUC. And in that letter, he asked them to investigate the multi-occupancy buildings insurance sector. And he had two main concerns. What he wanted to understand was the underlying causes of the year on year price increases that the market was experiencing and also assess the causes of the marked restriction in coverage that was available for multi occupancy buildings. So the FCA commenced work in sort of spring 2022 to investigate the sector. So as I pointed to, it involved engaging with the market uh, as well as an extensive data collection exercise. So 17 insurers and 26 brokers were involved in providing data and MI that the FCA went on to analyze. And in that September 22 report, it highlighted a number of findings, both from the uh, engagement exercise and also the data. So they pointed to a clear contraction in supply of insurance leading to reduced competition in the market. And they pointed to the fact that there's only five insurers really still out there able to write buildings exposed to flammable cladding risk. Um, so that was clearly not helping um, the sort of year on year price um, point. The data they collected spanned from 2016 to 2021. And it also suggested that the average, average premiums for buildings uh, with flammable risks had more than doubled over this period. Um, so about 125 increase from 6,800 to 15,300. Um, also, in the sample of firms they, they looked at, they saw um, broker retained remuneration of £160 million, pounds, which was uh, over the sort of um, level of staff costs that they saw in that market. So again, a, a point towards remuneration, um, not sort of sitting uh, where they saw it um, in terms of value. Separately, uh, and Charlie will cover this in a minute, they saw a further £80 million pound of commission that was paid to firms down um, in the distribution chain. So people like freeholders and property managing agents. And they felt that that was a contributor to the cost of insurance um, going upwards. But also they saw limited evidence on the demand side of the market really being able to place downward pressure on insurers and brokers, and particularly pointed to the fact that leaseholders, who in most cases are paying the bill, have no role in the process to exert any leverage or information that allows them to challenge the decisions being made. So as a result of that work, the FCA came up with a number of recommendations on how to address those findings, and they shared it in a consultation paper in April 2023. Then fast forward to September of, of, of the same year, so just about a month ago, they issued the final rules. And so we want to spend a few minutes talking through first the distribution chain and sort of what that looks like and why they had some challenges with it. And secondly, just talk you through what those rules are before um, Rob and Carolina look at the impact both on the insurance sector 
but also on the property sector itself. So Charlie, I'll hand over to you at this point. Brilliant, thanks Laura. Could we move to the next slide please? Excellent, great. So um, just to provide a bit more context on the distribution chain now. So on this slide, we're providing a high level view of all of the stakeholders and entities that can be involved in the end-to-end -end transaction of a MOBI policy. Um, what I'd say first as well is that in practice, this can be more simplistic than we've got on screen. Uh, it can also be a lot more complex and involve multiple brokers, intermediaries, managing agents and third parties. Uh, at one end of the chain, so on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see the insurer um, who typically underwrites and manufactures the multi-occupancy buildings insurance product. Uh, this involves pricing individual building risks at a net rate or a risk premium. Uh, and a very simplistic way of thinking about that net rate is it's the cost that the insurer feels is sustainable against potential claims. They factor in their operating costs and they're targeting some level of profit margin. That net rate becomes the gross rate when they factor in distribution and acquisition costs, such as broker commissions, managing agent commissions, the amounts paid away as part of remuneration further down that chain. Um, products are then distributed by insurance brokers. So insurance brokers are there to advise customers on appropriate cover, identify a product that best meets their needs and place it into the insurance market. Uh, brokers, as I've just said, take a commission for their distribution activities, which is built into that overall premium paid by the customer. Uh, in certain instances, we know that in these chains, there are additional fees and other remuneration mechanisms, such as profit commissions and work transfer fees and all sorts of different costs with different names can be applied um, either as part of the overall premium or in addition to that premium. Then if we look at the customer's side of the transaction, there are a number of entities involved. So now moving to the left-hand side of this screen, um, I'm going to start with the freeholder. Uh, traditionally, the freeholder has been seen by many insurers as the customer because they're named as the policyholder on the overarching contract of insurance. Um, freeholders will appoint property managing agents in many instances to manage the property, including arranging the insurance contract. Um, managing agents, as most people on this call will be well aware, are a separate entity who liaise with those insurance brokers to obtain coverage. In many cases, those entities will retain a service fee for the work that they perform that's charged in conjunction with the overall sale of the policy. Um, so as you can see, as we're moving through this chain, you've got commissions and various fees compounding on top of that net rate that the insurer has calculated as the price uh, that they need uh, against the claims that are, they project are gonna come in. Um, and then finally in the chain, you have the leaseholder. Uh, the leaseholder in many respects is the ultimate beneficiary of the Moby product. They're the ones that if a claim occurs, um, are gonna have remediation um, through the insurance product and they're gonna benefit from that insurance product. And they're also the ultimate party who generally will pay for the cost of the insurance through monthly service fees that they pay to the freeholder or through a managing agent. Um, what I'd say on about on this sort of end-to-end -end distribution and value chain as we think about it in the insurance sector, I guess the FCA have been concerned with these long distribution chains for at least the last decade. And they've published um, multiple publications since at least 2013, 2014 on their concerns. And that's been heightened by recent changes in our environment um, called product governance rules, which came in in September, 2022. Um, but also the new consumer duty, which was implemented on 31st of July this year. Uh, so long chains can cause a situation where multiple entities or third parties add distribution commissions and fees, and that could erode fair value of the underlying insurance product in the view of the FCA. Uh, long chains also can dilute the ability to oversee and control activities undertaken downstream, and insurers, brokers in the chain who are regulated by the FCA have various requirements in place to oversee, to ensure good governance, to ensure good sales practices, um, and to ensure good customer outcomes ultimately. Um, and then the last thing that I'd say about this, so arrangements where beneficiaries of insurance products sit behind a group or a master policy holder or another entity can lead to a lack of transparency of costs and justification of them. Uh, and it can also dilute the communication of the key benefits, the exclusions and the terms of the policy that has ultimately been taken out for their benefit. Um, if we move to the next slide. Um, so, so I'm just gonna briefly talk now what the F, through what the FCA has changed in response to those concerns. 
Um, I guess a number of changes are being implemented by regulated firms in this space. So the insurers, the brokers and the intermediaries in that chain, which will impact those downstream managing agents and freeholders. Um, currently, the MOBI rules that are being implemented, uh, bringing through changes that have an implementation deadline uh, at the end of the year, so 31st of December. Um, so if I just talk through some of these key changes that are coming through now. So firstly, uh, the FCA are including a new definition of policy stakeholders within their rule book, uh, which extends out the definition of customer uh, as it's currently written. So where on the previous slide I touched on uh, that freeholders had generally been treated by insurers as the sort of policyholder or customer in many instances, this new definition is going to extend out the requirements for an insurers to consider the interests and the needs of these policy stakeholders. So that applies to leaseholders. I mean, what the sector is currently also responding to is the fact that this is going to extend out uh, the scope of rules to other um, beneficiary type products within the insurance sector. So it's not just those in the built multi-occupancy buildings industry who are going to be affected by this. In insurance, we have many different sort of arrangements and schemes, such as group policies for employee accident and sickness and travel, uh, where, which are taken out at an employer level for the benefit of their employees. Or you might also have seen things like packaged bank account insurances, where if you pay a monthly fee for a packaged bank account, you get the benefit of, say, a travel policy or a mobile phone insurance. So this policy stakeholder definition is causing a wide impact in the insurance industry, um, but it's also going to cause changes um, downstream in the multi-occupancy building sector. Um, so secondly, the FCA have underlined their expectations in relation to distribution chain remuneration, as you might expect. So insurers and brokers are under specific rules now in relation to assessing fair value of their insurance products, uh, and they're required to complete annual product reviews and fair value assessments. Um, that extends to assessing all amounts charged in conjunction with the sale of the policy, including commissions and fees, and remuneration must be assessed as it being commensurate with the service provided by those entities who are charging those amounts. Um, so they'll put those services that are being provided under the microscope and they'll assess what is reasonable um, and whether they're taking an undue amount of remuneration in line with the services being performed in those chains. Um, if unjustifiable, then insurers and brokers need, are told that they must stop paying away that remuneration to those third parties. And ultimately, as part of the fair value assessment rules in the product governance part of the FCA's handbook, they have insurers have to remove products from the market if they cannot evidence fair value as part of those annual fair value assessments. And so the third point to highlight is the heightened expectations in relation to governance and compliance. Policy stakeholder interests and needs must be explicitly considered and brought within the insurer's view of the target market assessments that they perform. Uh, regulated firms are required to maintain adequate processes, governance and controls to ensure the needs of stakeholders are met, products provide fair value, that their information needs are met. Uh, and to achieve this, at the moment, we're seeing a much greater focus on the management information and data uh, that insurers and brokers are looking at throughout the distribution chain. So that could be information relating to remuneration, max commission fees, average commission fees, but it's also in relation to other data points like complaints that are lodged by policyholders, but in this case, it could be uh, down to sort of leaseholder queries, freeholder queries, etc. Um, and the final point that I'll talk through uh, on this slide is the heightening requirements for the way that information is transparently communicated and disclosed to leaseholders and policy stakeholders. So under these new expectations, um, they'll there is a requirement for the disclosure of clear information about the policy. Um, so there'll be a heightened expectation around the provision of summaries um, of policies, pricing disclosures, remuneration breakdowns, the alternative quotes gained um, by, for instance, managing agents and brokers in those chains, uh, and any conflicts of interest um, that might be in place for all of those entities in that chain. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Carolina, who's going to talk about um, a little bit more about how insurers are reacting um, to these changes that are being made by the FCA. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so the next slide, uh, this section is going to be covering how the insurance sector has been reacting to these rules uh, for the purposes of compliance going forward. So firstly, I just wanted to touch that, as mentioned before, 
uh, the deadline for the implementation of the rules uh, is at 31st of December of 2023, so quite soon. Uh, interestingly, the FCA stated that because they would have expected firms to already have uh, complied with some of these requirements or existing regulatory requirements, such as fraud and consumer duty, um, the, the, they considered the three months window to be uh, reasonable and sufficient for firms to, to respond and, uh, and implement the changes. Um, so what does that mean? It means that after the 31st of December 2023, uh, the FCA will be actively engaging with firms, scrutinizing whether they have responded to these rules and also whether they have done this uh, efficiently and adequately like uh, they would have expected. Uh, it's important also to note that, as Charlie mentioned, the scope of these rules, they are not limited to only uh, the multi-occupancy building insurance. Uh, there is a, a, a scope to also be uh, considered, given the fact that some of these policies uh, would have the same nature, the same background, uh, where the, the, the leaseholder or the, the, the person that would be um, the interested party is not the one paying for the policy. So uh, it's, it's just important to note that it's very uh, critical for firms to identify which products would be included within the scope of these changes uh, and respond uh, accordingly. Uh, so given uh, the nature of the distribution chain, uh, as was covered before, third parties such as property managing agents and freeholders are equally also expected to consider and meet the needs and interests of leaseholders here. Uh, as the, the firms within the insurance sector respond to these changes, uh, they would firstly, they have been firstly uh, conducting an impact assessment to understand which products would be uh, within the scope of these changes, and then whether those uh, policy stakeholders are being treated uh, with uh, the best uh, intention, and also there is a value assessment where their interests are also being met. Uh, alongside that, uh, reviewing contractual arrangements uh, with third parties within the real estate sector is also critical, given the fact that they will be they would be um, uh, very it would be very significant to define their roles, their responsibilities, and also ensure that those uh, sec th those those firms are also responding accordingly and also uh, aligned with the regulatory uh, expectations. So uh, having those contractual arrangements really well uh, defined and uh, their roles really um, clear is absolutely critical going forward. Um, alongside that, third parties are going to be monitored and uh, the onboarding processes are likely to be um, more scrutinized by the regulators. Uh, so that documentation, the evidence that those are being conducted uh, with aligned with the, 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 the rules that are coming in is really also critical for firms. Uh, in terms of remuneration schemes, the other side of uh, the, the rules, they also touch on the requirements and expectations as to whether firms are considering uh, the remuneration schemes and arrangements. So that includes reviewing those uh, current processes, arrangements, and also making sure that any, um, any, 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 any party within the chain uh, is is also servicing those uh, policy stakeholders uh, aligned with the the commission or any any uh, sort of um, uh, remuneration that they would be, they would be receiving. Um, so identifying those parties, which uh, at times could be quite complex given the the distribution chain, uh, and understanding what sort of commissions and incentives they are uh, receiving is going to be critical and also. Uh, is going to be uh, something that the regulator would be scrutinizing and uh, um, be, uh, monitoring. So the documentation here, the evidence of how this is conducted and performed uh, is going to be really important and expected to be in place. Uh, I think it's, it's really interesting also to say that uh, the commission rates and the remuneration arrangements uh, will have to be uh, commensurate, so justified and and really explain as to how they are conducted and whether they meet the commission's uh, rates that the, the third parties will be receiving. Uh, and we also have seen some interesting uh, movement within the, the market where some uh, brokers or some uh, insurance uh, entities have already responded to some of these uh, rules by uh, indicating that they will be um, 
simply reviewing, not only reviewing, but also stop to sharing the commissions with third parties such as landlords and to cap their own fees as well. So that that is quite interesting to see. Uh, and alongside that, it preempts some of the changes that are probably coming in uh, via legislation, as indicated by the regulator, the FCA, under the, the, the PS that was um, announced, where they said that it's very likely that commissions and incentives to third parties are going to be either uh, capped or might simply um, be no, will no longer be accepted. Uh, the rebroken part as well is another key factor that is aligned with the, the fact that those customers, leaseholders and freeholders will have to be equally considered and interests need to be met. So reviewing whether the customer base of any customer uh, has been through the, 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 the rebroking exercise and not being with the same providers for years and years will also be uh, uh, is inspected and really important to be um, aligned with the, the regulatory requirements. Uh, that could lead to a uh, conflict of interest. And the, the, the main part of the main uh, purpose of that is to ensure that uh, when uh, arranging insurance policies, both parties, as in freeholders and, and leaseholders' interests are being taken into account uh, by third parties and also the insurance sector. So there is a number of areas where um, the insurance sector is already uh, responding uh, or putting across to, within the chain. Uh, and it's very likely that to, to an extent the third parties within the chain and like the, 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 the property managing agents and, free, and freeholders will also be required and committed to respond and be uh, also um, Commensurate the services that they perform to the policy stakeholders, documenting documenting uh, a lot of these governance arrangements and being ready to respond to uh, a number of new uh, changes that are coming in. Uh, Rob Phillips is going to be now talking about how this is impacting the real estate sector, uh, and yeah, and what are the focus uh, that you need to be aware of. Great. Thanks, Carolina. Yes. So whilst we've had the focus there on the insurance sector <clears throat> and the impacts um, associated with that, we do envisage that there will be another uh, a number of impacts on, on the property sector as well. Um, I think in particular what we've done here is to list uh, what we anticipate um, managing agents, property managing agents and other affected parties in the property sector will need to be able to show um, in response to the new rules, bearing in mind again, as we've said, that very short implementation deadline of the 31st of December. Um, so the first of those, I think, will be a clear understanding of the rule changes themselves, um, how the new rules will impact processes and procedures that are already in place. So, for example, the exact roles and responsibilities of property managing agents, um, including expectations from insurance entities, um, disclosure around the remuneration arrangements associated with the purchase of insurance, um, and, and that kind of overall transparency point about accessibility of the information in that regard. Um, there's also going to be a need to demonstrate um, roles and resp responsibilities um, clearly being defined within the distribution chain um, and how those are likely to be impacted in light of the new rules. Um, this includes ensuring that regulated activities, FCA regulated activities, are not being performed by third parties uh, where that entity is not authorised by the FCA. Um, then there's the need to ensure that contractual agreements, uh, arrangements and service level agreements in place with insurance firms are regularly reviewed um, and kept up to date uh, in accordance with the new rules as they come into force. Um, governance arrangements, so the kind of procedure behind the buying, um, the purchase of, of insurance um, will need to be made very um, clear and transparent. There must be evidence of how the purchase of insurance has been aligned with the best interests of leaseholders. Um, and in the same regard, there's the need to maintain adequate information, uh, MI and data uh, on complaints and claims demonstrating that leaseholders' best interests and product value are being met. 
Um, and in that regard, uh, there was a recent media uh, publication um, stating that five UK broken groups have made a commitment to stop sharing uh, buildings insurance commissions with landlords and to cap their own fees. I think that came out just yesterday. Um, so uh, then moving on and there's disclosure of the total remuneration um, that's been received uh, for arranging insurance. Um, so that would be including commission paid by insurers. Um, intermediaries will need to be will need to disclose remuneration they pay to other parties, uh, including unregulated property managing agents and freeholders. It's worth possibly adding here that in the event that a property managing agent is also an appointed representative, there's likely to be even higher levels of FCA scrutiny. Um, the transparency point again in terms of uh, leaseholders timely provision and access to key information, including insurance materials, product features, remuneration arrangements and processes related to claims and complaints. Um, there needs to be proactive management of leaseholders insurance queries, uh, including potentially claims, noting that freeholders consent is not required in that respect. And then finally, where leaseholders have questions about insurance arrangements, insurance firms should respond to the, those queries in an appropriate way and provide adequate support to the leaseholder who has contacted them. So that kind of um, prompt and thoroughness of information point. Um, and that means that firms should provide the required information if a freeholder has not passed this on already and should do so without delay. So those are some of the key impacts that we see uh, or that we envisage um, happening for the property sector. Um, and on that note, I think I'm now handing back to Dominic, who's going to briefly cover how the Q&A session is going to work. Thanks very much, uh, everybody. Um, that was a lot of information um, and certainly uh, slightly eye-watering for any insurance brokers and those involved with having to um, um, collect and store and provide that information. Um, I just wanted to remind uh, attendees uh, that if you want to ask a question, please do so through the Q&A um, section at the bottom of the screen or top of the screen, depending on how it's configured. Um, I will be uh, fielding those questions to everybody who has spoken and to Paul, uh, who is about to speak uh, after Paul has spoken. So if anything has um, sprung up and that you're wondering about, please do post those questions and we will do our best to answer all of them before the end of the session. Um, so that was a little warning to give you time to think about it. Um, but uh, while you do that, I will hand over to Paul from WTW um, to talk about this sort of impact on the future of the market. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Turnbull. I lead the real estate practice at the insurance broker uh, WTW. Um, my job today is to talk briefly about the potential impact on the insurance market from the insurance broker's perspective. So Dominic, if you could give me the first slide, please. Now, the, the first potential unforeseen consequence could be a contraction in the number in the insurance market. The number of insurance brokers are actively looking to uh, get involved with residential business. Um, a number of reasons for this. The additional work that will be involved um, in demonstrating fair value, not only fair value in terms of what the broker receives for the work they do, but justifying any payments that are made to third parties, such as freeholders and agents. Um, there will clearly be downward pressure on commission earnings and other sources of income, which have already been touched upon. Uh, so the returns will fall. And there is the heightened uh, regulatory risk, which can't be underestimated. Um, the, the challenges around not getting it wrong and attracting undue attention from F the FCA are significant and may be a disincentive to some. And then we've also got the, uh, the challenges around um, segmentation. Um, Residential property will have to be handled in a different way to commercial property. Um, given that a high proportion of residential property actually sits within mixed portfolios, this is going to be difficult for many. Okay. Now, moving on to the question of cost. Well, the, the whole point of the 
uh, the FCA's work was to reduce the cost pressure on uh, leaseholders. So, I mean, will it actually lead to any meaningful reduction in cost? Well, I think first we've got to recognize that most insurers are not actively looking for residential business. And this is nothing to do with regulation. It's nothing to do with the, the FCA. It is because um, residential business produces a high volume of claims. Okay, and this situation is actually deteriorating and it is the claims that drive cost more than the deductions from the premium. Um, having said that, um, commission clearly impacts premium. So it is reasonable to expect that a reduction in commission, the other forms of income will translate into a cost reduction. Um, however, in terms of the number of people this will benefit, um, We've already seen a significant degree of self-regulation in the market. I mean, there are, remain bad practices as were identified in the FCA report, but many brokers have actually been paring back their commission earnings as pre premiums have risen in the hard market. So uh, we've also seen self-regulation coming from the insurers who have already placed caps on the amount of commission that they are willing to pay. So these factors are already in place. So it may be that it is a minority of individuals who actually benefit from the reforms. Um, that's all fairly negative. So it's probably best to um, finish by talking about um, opportunities. Uh, there is, residential business will be handled in a different way going forward. So there is considerable scope for specialist providers or teams within teams that only handle residential business and will have the infrastructure to handle it in a profitable manner. And also in the same way that some intermediaries have been incentivized to get in, involved in this space by the higher levels of commission, for some, particularly those more mindful of reputational hazards, it's been a disincentive to get involved in residential business where one of the key drivers is high commission rates to be shared amongst different parties. So it is conceivable that we will see new players coming in who are attracted by the idea of a more virtuous proposition. Okay, thank you for listening. Dominic? That's great, thank you, Paul. Uh, and thank you again to uh, all the speakers. Um, I hope that's been as enlightening for others as it has for me. Um, I'm very pleased to say we've got a few questions that have come in already. Um, so I will uh, see, uh, who is, is best able to answer them. And um, by all means, um, if other panelists than the one answering the question feel as though they've got something that could uh, usefully um, enhance what is being said, please do jump in. So don't feel restricted. Um, just given what you were talking about, Paul, given that it was just the point we've just heard, um, we've had a question from Jonathan Lovejoy, which I think would be helpful to explore. And, and that's, um, what the panel's view is, and we can broaden it out after you've spoken, Paul, uh, if others want to contribute, uh, of the scope of this as to whether it applies to uh, multi-occupied buildings with a residential element, as you said, and that difficulty of segmentation, or do you think it will also apply to 100% commercial buildings? And I guess it's that, that that point about affecting more of the property market than just residential. I wondered what your view was, was of that. Okay, well, there is no suggestion at the moment as far as I'm aware that it will impact on commercial, but I think the direction of travel is fairly obvious. So the when I talked about the self-regulation by insurers, that isn't just residential. They are thinking in terms of uh, capping commission rates uh, across the piece. So I think the likelihood is it will progress into the commercial sphere over a period of time, uh, not necessarily um, outlawing payments to third parties in particular, but requiring greater justification of such payments and everybody in the chain having to demonstrate value. Yeah, so uh, effectively the message is be, be ready for that to the industry. Um, Dominic, can I just uh, add a point on that one? Um, so I totally agree with Paul completely there. I just think, yeah, well, I guess where firms are coming from is if they've got their own sort of overarching governance frameworks and fair value frameworks and all of that sort of stuff in place, it becomes very difficult for them to treat sort of residential uh, um, policyholders or any different to sort of commercial policyholders. So they have to justify to themselves and their own governance forums why they're why they would treat them differently. And hence, I think Paul's right that 
the direction of travel will be in the commercial space will follow the residential. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, another question that's coming from uh, Neil, um, how will brokers communicate directly with leaseholders? How will they qualify them as bona fide? Um, could uh, Laura or Rob answer that or somebody else from Deloitte if you feel uh, so you have a strong view on that? I think the, the rules, they are uh, quite reasonable when it comes to the communication directly with leaseholders. It has been established that um, the, the leaseholders here, they, they would be considered as policy stakeholders, but however, uh, there isn't uh, direct expectations to be um, directly communicating with each one of the leaseholders. That would be um, practically impossible and also not within the expectations of the regulator. Uh, but it, what it is uh, expected here is to be able to understand what are the leaseholders' um, uh, interests, what are their uh, needs, and then being able uh, in, in, within the whole uh, population of leaseholders to respond to them by um, adapting the design of the product and also being able to arrange the insurance policy in, in the best possible way, taking into account not only the, the leaseholders, but also freeholders. So uh, the rule is is pretty um, clear that um, is equally apply uh, equally applies to those two uh, parties, leaseholders and freeholders, and therefore um, in a whole, uh, it would be um, expected that leaseholders' uh, ex uh, interests will also be um, uh, met and, and 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 they would also increase the understanding and well-being of the leaseholders. I think where, where you have a sort of property obligation in the chain, the, the idea is that the broker provides the information to them to disseminate mm -hmm. to leaseholders through the normal channels, you know, be that sort of letters or a, a website or whatever it is. So the information about the, remun the remuneration and the policy terms and conditions, et cetera, um, will will be provided to the managing agent to then disseminate to the leaseholders in their normal sort of course of business. Um, so as Carolina said, sort of, um, albeit, you know, the odd leaseholder might try and pick up the phone to the broker, bearing in mind they see the name on, on the documentation. Um, uh, the brokers we've spoken to aren't sort of scaling up for any um, mass engagement with leaseholders directly. Um, so they'll direct them to the appropriate channels. Yeah. And following on from that, we've had another question that asks whether the rules could affect landlords of assured uh, shorehold tenants as well. So how does it work in terms of rolling down the chain in that sense? Um, it does. Uh, well, the rules, they are quite um, broad in the sense that once uh, those uh, situations would meet the, the context or the nature of the, the, the chain here, whereby the, the leaseholder or the party uh, is paying for the for the insurers, however, not directly benef benefiting or being able to even uh, challenge costs or being able to challenge uh, practices. And in this case, if landlords are the party that is actually within the contract of insurance and also uh, being the, the, the key be beneficiary of the contract, then it would equally be uh, within the scope of the, the, the rule changes. Great, thank you. And and again, segueing neatly from that, um, Carolina or, 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 or Charlie or Rob, um, do you see the disclosure requirements applying to all policy stakeholders or being restricted to MOBI contracts? Um, so I think I started to cover this off on my slide. Um, and we do see it as being much wider, actually, and having much wider implications. And if people want to go away and look at this separately, we've produced a, a Deloitte blog on this subject. So the FCA are trying to uh, remediate the consequences of any of these sort of beneficiary type arrangements in the market where similar issues could occur, which is why they've defined policy stakeholder um, separately to their definition of leaseholder, which they're going to introduce into the FCA handbook. Um, so a few examples of where that occur could occur. So I talked a little bit through packaged bank accounts. Um, packaged bank accounts. In that instance, a bank takes out an overarching insurance policy, and the beneficiaries of that overarching insurance policy are the bank account holders. In many instances, you might pay a five or ten pound fee per month for your bank account, and you get a range of benefits. Some of them might be insurance benefits. 
So that's a specific area where this could occur. Also, um, most people through their employers will have various insurance benefits where the policy sets, sits at the employer level. Um, those sorts of policies could also be affected. Anything where that policy stakeholder who is sort of acting as a natural person, not as a business entity, but that beneficiary is a natural person acting in their sort of um, role as a consumer. They're paying some sort of fee that will equate to or contribute to the insurance premium um, could be affected by these rule changes. Um, we don't know the full spectrum of exactly what's going to be affected yet. Um, and there certainly is a spectrum to this. Um, but certainly situations that are so remote as, for instance, you purchase something from a retail shop and that contributes to their payment towards their liability or their office or their buildings insurance, that is going to be too remote. Um, but those examples that I gave at the start certainly could fall within the scope of these new policy stakeholder um, expectations. And so, Charlie, how, how will we get clarity on that? Is, is it something uh, are we going to get? further statements? Is it something that's going to be tested in the courts? Um, I'd say it's usually it usually comes out over the years through the FCA's approach to supervision and enforcement. Um, there's a lot of that in the insurance sector at the moment that's outside the scope of the multi-occupancy buildings review. Um, I mentioned briefly that we've had some quite vast regulatory changes in the financial services markets. One is product governance rules which requires product reviews and fair value assessments. They came in September 2022 for uh, general insurance. The other is the new consumer duty, uh, which is massive. It really is a paradigm shift that wraps around the entirety of the FCA's conduct regulation that spans the entire financial services sector. Um, both of these reforms um, are being supervised and enforced heavily by the regulator at the moment. So we haven't seen much enforcement action over the last 18 months, but within the last two months, um, we've seen multiple instances where the FCA is asking questions of insurance, insurers and brokers, how are you defining your target market? How are you assessing product value? It's these sorts of things and where they get publicized or they potentially lead to regulatory fines or censures or other action uh, that will lead to changes in the way that the market reacts and interpret these rules generally. Um, so I expect it will come out of that rather than be sort of formally tested in the courts or something like that. Great, thank you. And Laura, where, where a policy renewal was before the end of the year, uh, so when this uh, technically kicks in, will the policy fall in scope in the current year or at the next renewal? It would officially uh, be in the next renewal where mm. this sort of disclosure process would be, um, I guess, formally instigated. However, uh, as we mentioned, sort of number of brokers and insurers have been starting to implement a number of these uh, sort of changes to processes and um, practices already. So depending on who you, who you deal with, you may see some of this already coming through in your uh, renewal if it's in the next you know, couple of months, um, pre 31st of December. Um, so officially sort of next renewal, but you may see some of this coming in already um, because as we said at the beginning, the FCA has been signposting this for a while and has expected um, sort of the, the market to pick up and action this as it goes, rather than, you know, wait till the deadline. And I think the, the, the product assessment of those, um, the multi-occupancy building insurance is also something that they should be doing straight away. So firms are actually expected to be reviewing how those products will be uh, meeting the, the, the policyholders' uh, needs. Uh, and that should be from now, really as opposed to just when, when they have a renewal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and you know that that so that's how it would work for those agents that would be regulated by the FCA. Do, does the panel, and we've had a question um again from Jonathan uh, Lovejoy, does the panel have a view of how many managing agents are actually FCA regulated or what I guess what share of the market is covered by this? It's open to anybody to to answer. We don't have an exact uh, number at the moment, but based on the on the pro on the conversations that we have had, the insights uh, from the market, it does look like most of them would be uh, deemed as regulated by the FCA and therefore uh, consider appointed representatives. Uh, so, which would increase then the needs to um, meet those those uh, requirements by the, the new rules. Uh, and also, I guess, the, when it comes to governance arrangements, 
uh, in relation to these AIs or appointed representatives. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, scrutiny from the regulator and uh, the monitoring of all the documentation and being able to, as well as um, being able to, 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 to share all of those uh, documentations uh, to leaseholders going forward, evidencing therefore that they are being, uh, their interests are being met. It's going to be absolutely uh, critical when you compare to uh, property managing agents that is not regulated by the FCA. So they will be directly regulated by the FCA and therefore directly would be under the scope of these rules. Thank you. Um, Paul, you, you mentioned uh, potentially, um, I suppose, almost a, 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 a benefit in a sense at the end or, or a potential opportunity. Um, and, and I guess that's you know, to an extent, the the market cycle that as um, providers withdraw from the market and prices rise, that presents opportunities for other providers to get into the market in a sort of a level economics perfect market operation kind of way. Um, uh, we've had a question from Neil. Is there a possibility? Do you think that um, this extra workload and resource requirements um, may actually um, just produce a, an increase in price for insurance policies? I mean, it does seem like quite a lot of processes are being um, mandated effectively by the FCA? I think it's possible, um, but I don't think it's going to be the primary factor. I mean, the uh, because there are going to be limitations on the amount of commission that the insurer is going to pay, whether the brokers like it or not. So they can't push beyond a certain threshold. But I, I still think the sort of deterioration in uh, claims experiences for residential portfolios is a much bigger uh, factor and how premiums will move in the, uh, the years ahead. So the costs will just have to be dealt with. And uh, I think for a lot of brokers, once they've got the infrastructure in place, it will just it will just run through. So a factor, but not the primary factor. Yeah, just to add to that, I think one of the areas that was reflected on in the FCA's report was obviously uh, the sort of supply side. And I mentioned it briefly around the insurance capacity. Um, and that is, you know, fairly restricted, particularly for um, sort of, I guess, what's deemed high risk um, buildings. Um, and therefore, where you've only got a very small market and an increasing sort of claims frequency and severity, I mean, that, that as uh, Paul said, is a, a key driver of, of price. Um, and that's something the FCA hasn't really been able to tackle in its new rules. Um, I think they they have pointed to the fact that that is an issue in the market and needs to be addressed and has pointed to sort of other people in the market to help sort of um, meet that challenge. But I think would acknowledge themselves that that's not something that these rules address specifically. Um, and so that, that that is the the other sort of elephant in the room when it comes to multi occupancy buildings insurance. And these changes are not only limited to multi occupancy building insurance, just to add. Uh, is likely or it has been indicated that it's going to impact all the master policies or group policies. So it's not particularly uh, direct to these products only. So perhaps this is going to be a, a change that everyone is just uh, now realizing that it's going to be greater than expected ever. It's a, it's a big change to the market. So, so it's almost the well, I hesitate to say the law of unintended consequences because it feels like that, that that they may be intended at some point, but um, it's certainly the law of kind of um, uh, consequences beyond the immediate uh, in terms of both uh, the scope of the policy and the impact on on other parts of the industry. Um, speaking of the impact on parts of the industry, I wondered if any of the panel had views on a question from uh, Mark Welling, uh, who asks if there has been any feedback from property managers as to how they will replace the income from commissions. Um, we're being told they will convert to a fee uh, or incorporate into management fees, which attract VAT rather than uh, IPT and therefore increases costs. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Um, what I would say on this one is that's clearly not the regulator's intention. Um, and I think where brokers and the regulated firms in those chains who are overseeing those managing agents who undertake a practice like that, the broker would be expected not to distribute through those managing agents. And um, the whole point in this regulation is to make these sorts of fees more transparent and to reduce these costs. So managing agents looking to sort of replace their earnings from these commissions 
is really the wrong way of going about it, unfortunately. Um, they should be looking to justify a level of realistic commission that covers their costs um, rather than transfer to a different type of fee. So I think you'd see in those instances, brokers withdrawing um, their support for those managing agents. Um, they wouldn't be able to sell through them anymore. They'd expose themselves to too much regulatory and customer risk. It's certainly against the the spirit and possibly the letter of the, uh, <laughs> the new framework. And where they are appointed representatives, they're, they're for regulated by the FCA. If they continue to do that, then uh, there's going to be uh, consequences or there's going to be some, um, you know, uh, scrutiny from the regulator that will may result in um, further um, changes as to how they operate and the regulatory um, permissions that they have. And just so so I'm clear, because I, I must admit I don't know, um, for those not regulated by the FCA, uh, are there any sanctions of any sort that would be available um, if they are not acting in accordance with these rules? They do so fall outside. Oh, sorry, go. I was going to say they do fall outside the scope of the sort of the FCA's remit um, directly. However, as sort of Charlie's alluded to, if, if there are sort of brokers or other regulated businesses dealing with those um, third parties, then they would expect them, to, the the ones under their remit, to sort of act accordingly and take action if they're seeing things that aren't aligned with with the spirit of this. Um, but it's unlikely that they would sort of deliver any sanctions themselves to unregulated um, parties. And also the FCA uh, policy statement has indicated that there is uh, legislation under review by the government where there's going to be equally it's going to be changes that are would be addressed to the, the wider market so therefore the sanctions would potentially be there for property managing agents where they are not regulated by the FCA. Yeah I think that was mentioned a couple of at a couple of points in the uh, FCA statement that there's potential for future regulation um, or legislation. Okay um, I'm conscious of time and I think we've we've answered uh, all the questions that have been posed. Um, thank you very much to everyone who has um, ask questions. Um, I hope that has been helpful to uh, to to everyone listening. Um, I just wondered whether any one of our panelists had any final comments that they might want to share with um, with attendees. Um, any final thoughts uh, or sort of messages that you know key message to take away. Um, I'll I'll just run down the uh, the panel as I see on my screen. Paul, are there any sort of one sentence, 20 second top line um, things you'd like people to leave this meeting um, with? I think for me, it'd just be about managing expectations of leaseholders as to the benefit they will see. That's great. Succinct. Um, Laura. Um, I would probably say sort of if you're in this space and you're, you know, responsible sort of purchasing um, insurance, just, you know, ask the questions of the brokers and the insurers of the chain. See, as we've discussed, you know, in most cases they are regulated. They've been living and breathing these changes for the last few months. And so they should be able to sort of give you some steer and guidance on what your responsibilities are. Um, so definitely use them. Fantastic. Thank you. And Carolina. I think, as Laura said, is understanding what their roles are, the responsibilities that they've got, making sure that that is well documented and defined, uh, and more than anything, um, keeping evidence also of any interaction with disorders. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, final thoughts? Final thoughts. Well, I'm a, I'm a conduct risk man, so uh, <laughs> the name of the game is customer outcomes at the moment under the FCA's consumer duty, and you'll hear that from your insurers and brokers. Uh, ensuring fair value of insurance products, ensuring consideration of these leaseholders' requirements, any customers' needs or requirements is sort of the FCA's expectation now. Um, while they don't expect you to be a charity, um, taking a reasonable amount of profit is uh, is what they expect. So um, they're stamping out larger um, and unjustified commissions and fees. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And Rob, you have the uh, the final, final word. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I guess I've been mean, building on what Charlie's just said. The, the, the thrust of this clearly is to put the um, fair value and best interests of leaseholders at the fore and bearing in mind the short implementation deadline, so 31st of December, I guess it's that kind of mindset piece really of um, just 
sort of going through that check of of what is fair value and what is in the best best interest of the leaseholder and i think if that can be adopted um you know without delay then then you should be in a good position fantastic that's a fairly consistent message coming from everyone um consider the leaseholder the customer and um be aware of the rules Thank you so much to all of uh, the panellists. Uh, it's been really, really helpful. I hope people joining this uh, have uh, enjoyed it and found it useful. Um, we had a final ask whether the link, uh, the Deloitte blog link can be shared. We will be sharing um, the link to uh, the recording. Uh, and we can also, I think, share the um, link to the Deloitte blog with that with attendees. So yes, we can. Um, and I think just on the nose of 11 o'clock, we will bring it to an end. Thank you so much again for joining and hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you.